Hello everyone and welcome to the internet. What we're going to be doing in today's lesson is having a look at the factors that actually affect the rate of transpiration. So hopefully by the end of today's lesson you're going to be able to not only list those factors but also explain how they affect transpiration. To start us off though we've got a couple of questions based around our previous work so have a go answering these two questions in your book. I'm going to give you about three minutes to do this today. Let's check those answers then. So obviously mark your own work so you know what you've got right. First one, the definition of transpiration. Two marks available here. First one for saying the loss of water vapour, or you could have said evaporation of water. And the second mark is from the aerial parts of the plant or from the leaves. So give yourself a mark for each of those points. For question two, there's a range of marks available here. So tick any of these that you've got in your answer. So water enters the plant at the root by osmosis. It travels from cell to cell, and that's in the roots, obviously. When it reaches the xylem, then it travels up through the xylem, in through the stem and to the leaves. Some of the water is used in photosynthesis, and that takes place in the palisade cells. Some enters the air spaces and leaves the plant through the stomata by diffusion. Now you might also have put a point in there about the fact that the reason it moves up the xylem is because as water is lost in the leaves then we end up with a lower pressure up in the leaves compared to down in the root and so it moves from that area of high pressure to the area of low pressure. So if you put that you can give yourself a mark as well. 
So add up your scores and it's out of 10 today, or 11 if you want the bonus mark for the pressure as well. So give yourself a score out of 10 for me. So when it comes to actually carrying out any experiment to look at transpiration, then we use a very specific bit of kit. We use a bit of apparatus called a potometer. So you can see the spelling on the screen there. Now, the potometer is the thing you can see in the diagram. So what we end up with is on the right hand side, you can see there's a beaker of water and sitting in that beaker of water is a capillary tube. Now, a capillary tube is basically a really fine glass tube. So it's very narrow in the middle there. You can see that that's then set against the scale that we've got there, which to all intents and purposes is a ruler stuck on a bit of plastic. And the capillary tube is attached to the front of that, so it's held in place. The other end of the capillary tube goes into this vessel that's got a reservoir at the top, and then we shove our cut shoot of our plant in the other end, making sure it's nicely sealed within there. And you can see all the blue there is water, so it's nicely filled with water right the way through, with the exception of one little air bubble that we've got on our scale there. So when it comes to setting up the potometer, what we need to do is we need to get an air bubble into the capillary tube first of all, and you have a little syringe that does that. Then what we do is we line it up on our scale and we make sure we note down its starting position. What we then do is we carry out our experiment, however that may be, whatever factor we wish to investigate, and what we do is we're going to do that over a certain period of time. And what we can do is work out how far that air bubble then moves. Because as we evaporate water from the cut chute, then it's going to draw more water up into that little chute there. And that means it's going to pull the water along and the air bubble moves with it. So what we actually do is we're measuring how fast that air bubble moves to actually get an idea about the rate of transpiration. So what I'd suggest you do is do a little sketch of the diagram. The word potometer is important because they have asked that as a one mark question before. And also just jot down those four points about how we set it up. So I'll leave this up for about another three minutes to give you a chance to do that.
Okay, some questions for you to have a go at then. So three questions there, and if you finish in time and have got a bit left over, you can have a go at the extension. So answer those questions in your book for me. I'm gonna give you about three minutes to do this. So for question one, to work out the speed, we're gonna do our distance divided by time. Question two, the reason we repeat it is because if we only did it once, we may have done something a little bit strange. We could have developed an anomaly as our result. Now, if we only do it once, we'll have no idea that it is actually an anomalous reading. So what we need to do is do it multiple times to then allow us to identify those anomalies and obviously remove them before we calculate the mean. And our final one there, how we're going to investigate the movement of air on the rate of transpiration. We set up the potometer as in our initial steps. Then we carry out the experiment with the air not moving, or at least as best we can. And then we're going to do the exact same experiment, but we place a fan in front of our chute to create moving air. Obviously, you turn the fan on as well. So we could obviously use different speed settings on the fan if you want to do different ranges of speeds of air movement, but it then will give us different readings and we can then compare how air movement affects the rate of transpiration. Now, the really important thing here is in order to calculate the rate, it's the distance the bubble has moved divided by the time it took. So what we've got is an example of a calculation we could be asked to do. Calculate the rate of movement for an air bubble that travels 18 millimeters in one minute, 30 seconds. So have a go at working that out in your books for me. I'll give you just about a minute to do that.
So what we need to do is our rate is distance divided by time. So the distance in the question is 18 millimeters and the time is one minute 30 seconds. Now because we've obviously got mixed values there of minutes and seconds, convert it into just seconds first of all. Hopefully we know that one minute is 60 seconds, so 60 plus 30 gives us 90, so 18 divided by 90, put that into your calculator and you should get 0.2 and the units would be millimeters per second. So give yourself a tick if you got that right. What I'd like you to have a go at doing now then is to see if you can come up with a list of factors which would affect the rate of transpiration. Now, the best thing I can suggest that you do here is if you look in the bottom left corner, there's a little picture of some washing hanging on a line. And that's because if you think about what makes it good drying weather for your clothes on the washing line, it kind of is the same thing as what makes transpiration happen faster. So a little bit of a hint for you there. If you finish and have some time left over, then you do have an extension task as well. So I'm going to give you just three minutes to have a go at this. See how you get on. What we're going to do then is we're going to take each factor one at a time to go through them. So the first factor that I'm hoping you manage to get is temperature. So what we actually find then is that as we increase the temperature, then what we find is the rate of transpiration increases. And the reason for that is the same as why we hang our washing out on the line on a lovely warm day. Because when it's hotter, then water will evaporate faster. 
Now, when we evaporate that water faster, then diffusion of that water vapor out of the leaf is gonna happen at a more rapid rate, and therefore transpiration is faster. So see if you can have a go at finishing off those three sentences about how temperature affects the rate of transpiration. And you'll notice I've just given you the axes for a graph there. So see if you can sketch what the shape of the graph for temperature and the rate of transpiration would be. So let's see if we can get our axes the right way around and the shape of the graph. I'll give you about another two minutes to have a go at that. Let's make sure we got the words in the right places then. So as you increase the temperature, water evaporates faster from the leaf, diffusion of water vapor out of the leaf becomes faster, and the rate of transpiration increases. So give yourself a mark out of three for your missing words. Then if we look at the shape of the graph, we can see that it is a nice linear graph. So as temperature increases, the rate of transpiration increases. And these graphs, you need to know the shapes of them because again, this poses itself really nicely as one of those multiple choice questions at the start of the paper. They can give you the four different factors and their graphs and ask you which one is representative of factor for temperature, for example. So make sure you know those graphs too. If you didn't get it, sketch it in now. Same thing for you to have a go at for air movement this time. Fill in the blanks, sketch the graph for me. I'll give you about three minutes to do that.
So our second factor of air movement then, as air moves over the surface of the leaf, evaporated water molecules are, and you could have written this in a variety of ways, but the key idea we're looking at for is the fact that the water molecules are being moved away from the surface of the leaf. So that as the wind's blowing, it's taking those evaporated water molecules and moving them away from where the stomata are. So the faster the air moves, the faster the water molecules are carried away. This increases the concentration gradient between the leaf and air, so water diffuses out of the leaf faster. So give yourself a score out of four for your missing bits. If we look at the graph, it's slightly different this time. It's not just linear, it has a linear section at the beginning, but then it curves. So we actually hit a point where it's actually gonna level off in time. So make sure you've got your little graph for wind speed as well, if you didn't already get that right. The third factor for you to have a go at is light intensity. Fill in the blanks, sketch me the graph. Again, I'm going to give you about three minutes to do that. So light intensity then, the stomata open in the light and close in the dark. So increasing the light intensity will lead to more water evaporating, but transpiration will reach a maximum rate when all the stomata are open. So we hit that point, and you can see it in the graph on the right there, where it just plateaus, it levels off and forms that horizontal line. And that's because no matter how much we increase the light intensity beyond that, all of the stomata are already open, which means we can't possibly open any more stomata, and therefore we're not going to get any faster rate of transpiration. So make sure you've got the graph sketched, make sure you've got those words filled in, and give yourself a mark out of three for the ones that you did.
Final factor then is humidity. So first thing to do is see if you can write me a definition of what humidity actually is. Then finish off the missing sentence and the one at the bottom, again, finish it off using your own words. You've also got your axes for the graph, so have a go at filling in what you think the humidity graph would look like. So I'm only going to give you two minutes for this one because it's a bit shorter this time. When we talk about humidity, we're talking about the amount of water that's already in the air. So a humid day is one where you walk outside and the air feels that really heavy atmosphere. So you kind of walk out and your clothes just kind of feel like they're sticking to you already. And that's because there's a lot of water present in the air. If it's a low humidity, then it's pretty dry. So that means we don't have much water in the air already. So what we find here is decreasing the humidity will create that steeper concentration gradient and that means that by decreasing the humidity we increase the rate of transpiration because if there's already a lot of water in the air around our plant then we've got a very shallow concentration gradient and that means that we're going to have a very slow rate of diffusion now that obviously gives us the opposite shape of our graph to what we've been used to so humidity is kind of the odd one out, if you like, that you've just got to remember that a higher rate of humidity leads to a slower rate of transpiration. So make sure you've got those all correct in there and sketch the graph because remember, it could be that multiple choice question on your exam. Last thing to do today then is have a go at answering this question. Explain why any factor which increases the rate of photosynthesis will increase the rate of transpiration. And to help you out with getting your answers to the right place, then those of you aiming for up to grade five, you've got some hint questions on that left hand box. Those of you aiming for above the grade five, particularly the seven plus then, it's the three on the right. Make sure you've included those in your answers. So I'll leave this up for about three minutes today, but as always, if you need longer, just hit pause and take as long as you like on your plenary task.